This is Coda Radio, episode 505 for February 13th, 2023. Hey, good buddy. Welcome back to Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show. Take it a pragmatic look at the art and the business of software development and the whole world of technology. My name is Chris, and joining us every single week, it's our host, Mr. Dominic. Hello, Mike. Hello. How are you, Mr. Fisher? Good, good. I was going to make a sports ball mention in the intro, but then I realized we're days after the sports ball. We are days after the sports ball. We are levitating above the sports ball, hung by just a few wires in our fantastic red robes. Yes. That, yeah. Oof. Wow. I would actually think that more of our audience than average probably just skips the whole thing. Don't you think? Yeah, I would say more than your average podcast, but I I, I know for a fact we have a few. They could be like me. They watch the sports ball when it's like a big event an excuse to eat lots of wings. So, yeah, I mean, think about it. Every two wings is an entire bird. It's crazy. That's a lot of wings. <laughs> it's a lot of birds. I believe it is. Uh, I believe it's 300 birds a minute is what our rate is. Then I, I was a blight on the chicken population yesterday. <laughs> Might have been a second. It's something that works out to be like 9 billion birds a year in the U.S. alone. I know it's crazy. Yo, okay. Can I just tell you, I'm not like virtue signaling. I'm not, I just want to, I just want to show you from my perspective. I didn't know yesterday was the Super Bowl. It's the second year in a row where this has happened. I actually thought it was next Sunday. And then I heard people talking about how they were going shopping. I thought, oh, look at people. They're ahead of, they're ahead of, they're a week ahead for the Super Bowl. Cause I'm sitting here doing Linux Unplugged yesterday in the studio. And then afterwards I realized, oh no, it's today's the Super Bowl. <laughs> I turned on the TV. <laughs> so, um, you know, I picked the Eagles. Because I like Eagles, and uh, they lost. So that's all that I know. But that's yeah. You know, so I imagine some in the audience might be like me, where they just don't even pay attention to it. But I do like to watch for the ads. No crypto this year. No, no. In fact, if we have time, I have a little ditty on that mm -hmm. actually. But we can save it. We did get some feedback, so I think we should probably jump right into it. Diving in. Christian writes, "This is a uh, loved episode five hundred four, but I wanted to bring another framework to your attention for the multi-platform development world." And I was wondering if Mike's got a take on it. It's called Avalonia. Yeah, Avalonia UI, I guess. Uh, Avalonia UI.net. Oh, oh, Chris, how soon you forget. We covered this when it was brandy new. Aha. Uh -huh. About 100 episodes ago. Oh, all right. All right. Okay. Now refresh my memory. Did we like it? <laughs> um, we did. We remember we had like, we were going through all the platform, cross platform mobile UIs. We did, th this is a .NET one. We covered this one. It did Linux as well. Also, the, remember the Uno platform? Mm. Yeah. Before that, got the big old huggeroo from Microsoft. Uno <laughs> got the huggeroo. Uh, yeah. I liked Avalonia. I did, I did a couple small Linux GUIs in it. It's, uh, it's definitely grown up a bit since back then. But it's, uh, you know, with Maui coming out, maybe it would be a tough choice for me to make today, but it's certainly certainly a cool choice, especially if you're deep in that .NET XAML world. Yeah, that it, it looks really slick on their uh, their examples on their website. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Oh, man, I'm just getting to that point where I'm forgetting. I'm probably forgetting more than I remember about these shows at this point, you know? I mean, 500 episodes. Well, there's been so many. Yeah, it's just it's too much, too much. All right, well, uh, Liam is thinking about getting new rigs. Says, uh, good day, gentlemen. Been a Coda radio, radio listener since the start. I believe my introduction to Jupiter Broadcast News was via Cybite. Righteous. Happy science. The System76 Pangolin became available today. Will anyone on the JB team have the ability to review it? I'm fairly open to a hardware refresh coming up, and I'm currently thinking this is my leading contender. Thank you. So um, I, I am considering it. Yeah, I, I am considering it. I... I was thinking about grabbing it to go to scale and doing a review on the road to scale, but then I decided I'm not going to scale. Um, so that ain't happening. But I, I have been thinking about it. You know, so the thing that I think interests people is that it's an AMD-based laptop. Yep. So you're getting an, a, a Ryzen 6800 CPU in there. Um, you can get up to 32 gigs of RAM, 140, 144 hertz display. Um, and, and, you know, and obviously the kind of the hope is, is that if it's an AMD stack, it's kind of driver free, problem free, I guess. I think that's a good contender. The, you know, it's, it's kind of a funny thing to say, but these laptops, these 15 inch laptops that have num keys on them, you know, the, the 10 key. Yeah. Sometimes it's great. And sometimes it's not, and it's kind of build specific on how that works, but I like the ports, you know, I like the options. I like the performance. So I have been thinking about giving it a try and seeing. 
We'll see. It's got physical, interesting physical switches for turning off the camera too. Yeah, I mean, it. I am not a numb key fan on laptops, so definitely wouldn't be maybe a choice for me. Uh, but I am an Ethernet fan on laptops. You God, are. I love Ethernet. On, oh, I love it. That's nice. It's got one of those little half ports, you know. But I'll take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, other than the num key, I like it. I mean, I'm. I, I don't know. I'm still rocking my Dev One. Yeah, I think for me the question would be: What's the what are the thermals and the fan noise like on the? For me, it'd be the fan noise and what are the onboard speakers like? Mm, right. That's right. A, that's a big uh, big win that the Dev One has uh, over most of the Linux laptops I've used. That's a great point. So especially if you're going to be traveling again, I can't tell you how many times I've just like loaded up a couple movies or you know. YouTube videos. Or whatever. You could just watch it with the built-in speakers. Yeah, just like throw it on the nightstand. God, that is nice. All right, so Dan writes in, said, I started listening to you two when Chris announced the availability of the Coda Robe 1.0, and I've been hooked ever since. Robe classic. Yeah, the classic. <laughs> he says, I've been hooked ever since. I regretted all this time not getting one the first time around. It's a noble thing to regret, really. I mean, if you're going to have guilt over something and regret, remorse, <laughs> that that's a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, it's a small batch item. Looking forward to my robe. Long live PHP. <laughs> mm, See, so you were doing so well. <laughs> Happy belated 500. Oh, you know, our audience has been listening for a while because they have refined their ability to troll me so well. At Remembers Only tweeted me, uh, put me in coach. I'm ready to code. The shipping on the robe went flawless. I see no reason why at Chris Last can't do a robe promo every single month. I agree. In fact, I just I got my my robe 2.0 that I by the way I didn't I'm waiting for the freebie. <laughs> there are robe differences. There are robe differences. Yeah, it's a good unit. It's a good unit. We haven't ordered any of the, uh, you know, like the I don't know what you call them, but like the house robes. We haven't ordered any of those. Yeah, I'm just I'm just trolling you. I also got the tumblers, and I have to say, I my budget appreciates you because that is a sturdy lid, sir. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a sturdy lid. And it's metal. So, <laughs> And also, I think in a combat situation, you could throw that thing at somebody and hit them right in the noggin. You know? I think it's a combat-ready tumbler. I'm, I'm surprised. Uh, also, the winos in my family are all very excited because it, apparently it's insulated somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should keep their... I know how they like to put ice in their wine, so it should keep their ice... It should last a long time in their wine. They, 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 this is very, very classy. Ice and some seltzer. They're, yeah. <laughs> They're doing it high school style. Yeah. I get it. I get it. I get it. It makes the, then you can buy the cheaper wine. Uh, so if you want to grab your robe, you can head on over to uh, the Jupiter Garage, jupitergarage.com, or there's a link in the show notes. So you can get the tumbler and the uh, sticker we're doing until supplies run out. We should do it forever. Never again. Never. We'll see. Never again. We'll see. Don't worry. We'll see. You know what we should do? Coder box of wine. <laughs> Coder box of wine. We need though. We need to work with uh, like some vi vineyard somewhere. You know that could that could produce us like their their blend wine in a box and then just put our Lego logos on. Oh my stuff. god! You know, <laughs> kind of real Trump steak. The worst is I don't really like wine. So <laughs> no, I don't either. Actually, it's the one case where I'll be safe. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I won't overdo it. Yeah. But God forbid, if we ever did like a coat or gin, Jesus. Actually, I'll just be dead on the floor. I mean, it's no chance. Although with the tumbler, my laptop will be safe. And that's really all that yeah. matters. <laughs> Lino.com slash coder. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account. And it's a great way to support the show while you are checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting built for developers with the best support in the business, real humans, and the best pricing, 30 to 50% cheaper than the hyperscalers out there that want to lock you into their system. If you want to build a big system, you can do that. Like I have a rig that has 96 gigs of RAM and 48 CPU cores. And man, does that thing just hum. Like its day-to-day -day work is matrix chat, but um, when the matrix chat is not so busy, we'll also throw other jobs at it because we got all that you know horsepower. So one of the things we've been doing recently is running Whisper on there to do some of our transcription. Coda Radio has gotten transcribed for the last couple of weeks using Whisper on our Linode. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, I have what they call a Nanode, which is a box with one gigabyte of RAM. And this is all we need out of this box because it's our status machine. So it's got one CPU core, one gig of RAM, just a little tiny Linux box that just checks on the status of our services and runs a health check and 
shows us the page if something's down, just like a little dashboard. And I love having it on its own dedicated nanode because it's a perfect kind of use of that. And I just think those nanodes are great for some, something just like that, you know, like a status page or a, a blog or a, a gallery, that sort of thing. I don't think I'd put like my next cloud on a nanode, but you could probably the next step up. Uh, my other systems are all kind of, they all kind of range. I have a two gig RAM system. I have eight gig RAM system, 32 gig, 16 gigs. Looking at my list right now as I, as I do this, I would say probably 16 gigs is the most common deployed for us because we'll just run a lot of stuff on one box with containers. You just get a lot of flexibility like that. And Linode has 11 data centers all over the world. They're bringing online another dozen. So you can get the right hardware combo and location to really get the performance either you want or your end user, whoever that might be, needs. And of course, Linode has great documentation. So you can wrap your head around these things and take advantage of their DNS tooling or their S3 compatible object storage. I love that. Love their S3. Like one of the things we just have recently set up is with our PeerTube instance. We run PeerTube on Linode. And you can actually, with the latest version of PeerTube, you can live stream using object storage. And what we use on the back end is an object storage bucket to hold the file while we're live streaming. And so we don't have to worry. This has been a problem in the past, but we don't have to worry about a really long stream filling up the local disk anymore. It's so nice to just kind of integrate those solutions and solve a problem that means that you're not going to have an emergency that takes a system down that you got to fix. You can just address it as part of regular ongoing maintenance. That's a way better place for us to be in. And Linode has all kinds of tooling with infrastructure management and Kubernetes support that make all that possible, as well as log viewing and performance metrics, dashboard that gives you an idea of how busy your system is. I was, when I was sitting here chatting about our Nanode that runs our check pages, I was looking at its CPU charts and its disk charts too, just while I'm sitting here talking to you because it's so well laid out. I'm just like, okay, yep, everything looks right. Yep, there's when I rebooted the box. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> there's when I was doing the updates. Otherwise, it's just, you know, business as usual. And Linode just keeps on running. It's really part of our secret sauce. Super great performance, great pricing, great support, and a solid company that built the product on its merits. It's a really good product. I think that's probably what matters the most. So go try it out, get 100 bucks, and support the show. You just go to linode.com slash coder. You get that 100 bucks. That's linode.com slash coder. So the telemetry debate has come to Google's Go. Russ Cox, a Google software engineer uh, who steers some of the development, of the open source Go programming language has presented a plan to implement telemetry in the Go tool chain. And of course, to make it effective, they're recommending that it be on by default, i.e. you must opt out. Telemetry, as Cox describes it, involves software sending data from the Go software to a server to provide, to provide information about which functions are being used and how the software is performing. Supporters of the proposal want to discuss how telemetry should be done and detractors say that the issue is it shouldn't be done at all. They don't want it considered, period. And of course, the conversation has, as you would expect, strayed into, well, this is also extra bad because Google's involved and we already have people that don't want to use Go because of its association with Google. And now that we're adding telemetry, it's only going to deepen that association. And so you have a rather robust debate that's starting to turn a little ugly in the Go community. Yeah, I, I don't love this idea of telemetry on the language level. I don't like it. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not surprised about how hostile the conversation turned. I guess I'm a little disappointed, but wish it didn't go that way. But I, you know, this is the reason I won't use Firebase in projects, right? Because it's Google data. I, yeah, I just don't. I don't like it. If it wasn't associated with Google, is it okay? Is it? No, I don't, I don't think I want any telemetry on the language. Okay. So it's just nothing at that level, period. That's where you draw the line. If you want to do it at the application that you're developing, well, okay, that's a different well, story. So one, this telemetry is going to Google, right? Not to you, the third-party developer. So it's different if I put in like debugging telemetry into something, right? or even basic logging, like implementing like a datadog.com can do stuff like that, right? Yeah. You know, like I don't want the Ruby Foundation to get a bunch of telemetry on customer applications. It's it's not specific to Google. It certainly makes it worse that it's Google, right? Clearly their argument is, well, we need to know where to invest future resources. We have to justify to the powers that be that money needs to be spent, that, you know, like, 
you could kind of understand it from like the developer from Cox's perspective here. He's got an OKR he's got to hit, and his OKRs don't actually uh, um, don't actually apply to anything that's pushing go forward in a way where people need it, and he needs data to quantify his case to his manager so that way he can get his OKRs to be focused on the right thing. I mean, it's probably what it comes down to. So, so this is where there's a separation between, like, I think the team, the Go team, and the Google, the engineers at Google, like the Googlers, are, I'm sure, like, fine, awesome people. I've talked to some of them. Not Russ Cox. I don't know him from Adam, but I'm sure he's fine, right? I'm sure he's great. It's just the principle. So there's a couple of problems here, right? Let, let's take the nearest analogy to Go from, like, the way the language is run. And you could either say C Sharp or Swift, Right. It's open source, but it's kind of controlled. But, you know... Yeah, big corporate backer. Big corporate clear backer. Clear part of the strategy. Although I sort of feel like Go is actually more controlled by Google. Maybe it's more analogous, you know. Eh, they're all... Actually, C Sharp is pretty controlled by Microsoft, and so is Swift, but... Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, I think they all are. I think they're actually all very analogous in that sense. So if the story is that Microsoft wants to put telemetry into every C Sharp method you call, I think you probably don't like it. Yeah. I don't know that that doesn't open up some privacy concerns for for end users. It also seems like you could accomplish quite a bit just by analyzing open source project repos that use Go. Right. I feel like CodePilot it literally exists to do this, right? Why couldn't I? I know Google just kind of flopped on their their uh, AI Chat GTP whatever. What was it? Bard was it called Bard? How bad is that? That was terrible. But I'm sure they have something like that that can analyze a bunch of Go repos, right? I mean, who knows, dude? Well, I hope so, right? Maybe. 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 <laughs> we know Microsoft can. I mean, I I, I feel like, uh, like a level that I would almost be okay with, to be honest, is like Swift Package Manager or the Go Package Manager, or, uh, and I think Microsoft does this. What the hell do they call it? NuGet? I was just doing .NET this morning, too. That's the worst part. NuGet, right. They're their, their package management for, for C Sharp and .NET projects. That seems like where you might want some telemetry to see, all right, well, who's pulling, you know, what are our most popular open source projects and not just getting it from GitHub, right? We want it right from the horse's mouth. You could get all kinds of information on that that I think would be helpful to say, all right, well, I don't know, right? I I, I can't think of a good, I don't do any go really. So, but, you know, Swift, you could have like, okay, well, we can't mess with Alamo Fire. Right, we have to make sure that we're working with the Alamo Fire team to keep up compatibility because lots of Swift projects use it. Or on the .NET side, you could Newton Soft, right? Like a lot of a lot of folks are using it. Got to work with that open source team to make sure that you know our upgrades don't break it. That seems super reasonable, and that's at a level where I'm already going out and pulling either you know a package or like full source code, depending on how you're doing it, depending on your ecosystem. I think that would be cool, but telemetry on like every t- every method I call or every function I use, it that just I mean, this is I mean, I do have a bias here, right? Like for years I've resisted using Firebase. I don't really care for Flutter for this reason, right? For the Googly aspect of it. I'm not saying they're gonna do anything evil, but it's certainly something to think about. It's in the back of your mind. Yeah, I guess I'm not neutral on this one. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to get your take. That's what those are the ones I prefer is when you're not. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah. All right, let's talk about Bard a little bit. So, uh, wow. First of all, horrible name. I am. I, I can't believe they came up with a worse name than Chat GPT. I honestly thought it was like an education thing when it popped up in my newsfeed. I'm thinking, oh, this is about like Shakespeare, right? The Bard. Right. Yep. That, that. So I think I think that's part of the that's the the Shakespeare reference. Also in Celtic cultures, a Bard is a professional storyteller. You know, so I think that's the other kind of reference. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So just what it comes for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, well, it told a fault. It, it told a work of fiction. Isn't that something? So they do their demonstration and it gives an answer about, you know, what could I tell my nine year old that this telescope has done? And one of like the three or four answers it gives is incorrect. And Google stock dropped 10% after that. It is wild. But what's even more incredible is the kind of mini revolt happening inside Google now. Employees are slamming Sundar Pichai for rushing the announcement. They say rushing Bard to market in a panic validated the market's fear about us. One highly rated uh, meme going inside Google said they, they have these meme generators that they've been doing and they've been memeing a photo of a bird doing a face palm and people are mocking Sundar Pichai. Google employees have been filling out their internal message boards 
with basically just nothing but hate. Memes that describe it as rushed, botched, uh, comically short-sighted. And um, Google employees have been uh, pointing the criticism at the CEO. The uh, user, not Patrick, said, it's time for Pichai to go. He's been criticized for a lack of foresight for years, but I wonder if this catastrophe will be the straw that breaks the board's back. Now, is it really this bad? You know, or is, is everybody overreacting? I mean, I don't know. I've botched demos, although not Google, right? Yeah. I, I don't, I mean, is it time for Pachai to go? That seems like a lot. I don't know, actually. Think about for the last few months, right? We've been covering stories about just slop after problem after slop after issue at Google. Been a lot of issues, a lot of problems. And um, it seems like there's sort of, I think what we have in front of us is a real sign that there's a problem. I've been thinking about this, actually. I think our first sign that something was deeply wrong at Google was when Microsoft bought GitHub. That should have been Google's Git. You know, Google, at that point in time, Google was the open source company. They were the bigger player in open source. Yeah, but they, they, weren't, they weren't the ISV support company. They weren't the company that you're, you know, non... Well, they had Google Code, right? They were, trying, they were just trying their own Google thing. Google Code was so not good, though. Yeah, they were trying their own thing. And instead of buying the, the market leader, they tried to build out their own thing. And I, I think it just happened again in AI. If we go back in time a month and you would have asked the world, who's the leading tech AI company, the entire world would have said Google. And then ChatGPT becomes a thing on the, on the scene and Microsoft is all in on it. And Satya Nadella seems to be tap dancing his way around this ChatGPT thing that really makes that glory shine on Microsoft in a really, really well done, well executed way. Microsoft has now moved to the front with this little independent company, ChatGPT, in their pocket. And a small startup that got some money managed to outlap Google, and Microsoft managed to hook their wagon to that and get that glory onto them. And they've already shipped it in Bing when Google has been working on this stuff behind the scenes for nearly 10 years. They really failed. This is bad. Like right now, in the eyes of the world, Sundar Pichai looks like a clown, and Satya Nadella looks like the freaking king. And he's got a big chat GPT hat on, and he's dancing away at the disco, and Google is panicking. And it's wild to watch their staff turn on them. It's wild to watch this just fail to execute. And if I think you zoom out, and you look at how Microsoft has outfoxed Google to become the number two in cloud, when Google probably, you know, like Google could have had that too. They just, they just do not put it across the finish line. They build these products up. They get them real big, but they just don't seem to be closing the deal. I, I'm, I am, I think we will look back at this and be shocked that Google lost this, this crown, this, this AI crown. And Google shocked. And you can tell in the way they're communicating in their events, they're constantly trying to stress all the various AI projects that they already have. But I believe one of the reasons the market responded with a 10% drop after their demo is because Google didn't show you anything new. One of the things they demoed was Google Lens. The same thing they demoed at Google, like the exact demo from Google I.O. It's a problem. The pro that, that, I think it is a problem. But I, I, for me, the problem is Google kept wanting to show you, look at all the amazing AI applications we can make. We're Microsoft for years now, right? We talked about it on the show, the Lewis engine their bot framework, right? They've had like so many versions of this kind of use our, you know, machine learning models, use our, you know, AI infrastructure such as it is to develop your own, you know, Teams bot, Slack bot, whatever, right? I'm, you know, I have a new fully GUI version of Alice coming out hopefully in two weeks. And the original OG version from years ago was a Microsoft Lewis Slack bot, right? It was a running off the Microsoft bot framework using their Lewis natural language processing and ML framework. And I, I just don't think Google has ever really had that focus on ISV, you know, de developer enablement where Microsoft, that's kind of their bread and butter other than Azure, right? Which 
you know, they, they make a lot of money making devs' lives, especially for small shops, super easy by giving them tools and frameworks that, that sure, you can run them elsewhere. Uh, although in the case of Lewis, you really couldn't. But they run best on Azure, and the setup's easiest on Azure. This seems kind of, for Microsoft to do chat GTP, like we were talking about yesterday in OpenAI, just a natural extension of that strategy, where Google's strategy kind of feels like business model du jour, right? It's like going to Panera, and who knows what the soup's going to be today. You know, one day they want to show off that they can make you a dinner reservation, but they don't want you to actually use it, right? They got clever with Gmail, but that's really just an enhancement to their own, albeit dominant, email product. You know, Google Code, I'm sorry, was always bad. Their equivalent, which I can't, Google App Engine, right? Their equivalency to Azure, terrible, right? Azure was always better, uh, unless you were in the narrow band right in the beginning of being a Java shop, because Google did do some great stuff for Java developers, but then they come out with their own language Go and it's kind of fragmented. Um, but if you were, you know, Python, Ruby, whatever, Heroku for a long time was a great bet, or honestly, our beloved Docker on just a uh, Linode VPS was, is a great choice. In fact, you could do the two-click install thing, right? And there were other providers that support very similar things. Some of, you know, some of them we've had on the show, so... I feel like what's hard for us on the outside of Google to appreciate is Google is a company in which in which some of their biggest struggles came out of a hatred for everything that Microsoft represented. When Google started, they hated everything Microsoft was. And now they have they have lap doesn't feel like it's the right word. It's like Google has become their own worst version of what they hated. And Microsoft somehow managed to like get it back in gear again. I, I, I just, just think this is really, really quite a historical little thing that happened right at the beginning of 2023. Well, we should also just, for folks who haven't been listening for, you know, over a decade, the, the big one, right, the big fumble was deciding to get into an epic lawsuit with Oracle or allow themselves to be set up for that when Oracle bought Sun because they just institutionally did not want to make a deal with Microsoft to use C Sharp. Instead, they used Java. And, you know, Whatever you feel about that, it cost millions of dollars to just, yeah, it was crazy. Tailscale.com slash coder. Go there to get a free personal account for up to 20 devices. It's not a limited time thing. It's not a trial. You just get it for free for up to 20 devices. It's so slick. I, if there was ever a product that made me want to use the in a world, you know, like trailer voice guy, that it's, it's Tailscale in a world. Where networking has been changed forever. Tail scale. Simple, secure. For a team of any size. <laughs> okay, I can't do it very well. But it deserves, like, the trailer voice guy doing a read for tail scale. It is that epic. It's built on top of WireGuard, which gives us trust and security. It installs on any device in minutes, so you're not going to spend days getting it set up. And I think that's worth underscoring maybe about 18 times, because uh, I used to have to physically install VPN boxes to get VPN set up. This installs on any device you got, mobile device, VM, VPS. In fact, this is a great way to kind of bring multiple VPSs together, even from different providers across different networks on one flat network that you control, protected by the WireGuard noise protocol. It's a mesh VPN that you can get up and going in just minutes. Using the best VPN security in the business, you can quickly and easily create a secure network between your servers, your computers, your mobile devices, your cloud instances, it's great. I got it on everything. I got it on the Pies. I got it on my family computers. I got it on my Odroid. I got it on my desktops. It is the only way I sync my contact data, my calendar data, my note data using my Android device. I do not sync any of my private information anymore over the public internet. Full stop. I do it over Tailscale to a Nextcloud instance living in my Tailnet. And Tailscale is always running. The client is very smart about what traffic it routes to your tailnet versus what goes out to the public internet, so you can leave it online and persistent. There's lots of nice tooling, like Tailscale Send, which is essentially like AirDrop for everything in your tailnet. You got Tailscale SSH, which lets you establish SSH connections between your devices in your Tailscale network, authorized by your Tailscale access controls. Speaking of access controls, they've recently rolled out auditing, improved auditing tools, including the ability to audit your access controls, and any changes that were made via the API. Mm. Are you getting what I'm saying? You could just like install it and have a great, secure, flat mesh VPN network. Yeah, you could do that. You could do that. You could also change 
the whole way you approach networking. It's like just kind of up to you how far you want to take it. But either way, you're going to love it. And the way they've built this is you're sending traffic between all your machines. So they can give you up to 20 machines for free because they're not like sitting there relaying your traffic all the time. I think it's some circumstances, some, there's like a relay involved sometimes. Don't know. Honestly, haven't ever hit it. But the way they've architected their network is such that they can offer up to 20 machines for free because they're not having to manage your traffic. You're doing that. It's machine to machine. They're just kind of doing the magic backplane for you. It's a really great service with a lot of nice options. And I think for developers in particular, it's a requirement. You're going to love it. Go try it. Support the show. I'll leave it at that. You guys know I could keep going. You know how much I'm excited about Tailscale. So go try it yourself. Tailscale.com slash coder. You're going to thank me. Tailscale.com slash coder. So there is a massive Web3 crackdown happening this week. It is bonanzas. Just really quick. Web3 is, I define that as any of these new projects that have a token with them, you know, so like a blockchain project, an NFT thing, or a, a decentralized web app, but for some reason has a token that people are speculating on in the background. These Web3 projects, I'm very, very skeptical of all of them. I believe none of them pass, or I believe they all actually pass the Huey test, which, are, which is whatever. I think they're all securities, or the Howey test or whatever it is. I think they're all securities. That's Ultimately, what seems the SEC believes as well. Um, so you noted it. First of all, no Super Bowl advertising for any crypto projects this year. Yep. Super Bowl banned it, I think, for obvious reasons. The SEC has been going after in the last week some major exchanges like Kraken and have them shut down their staking where people can try to get yield off of their crypto. Uh, they're suing the company behind the Binance stablecoin. So they're trying to take out the Binance stablecoin. And it has, in fact, depegged uh, since they started that process. They've put out, the SEC has put out a video warning users away from crypto staking. And uh, the Coinbase CEO this morning got up early, got dressed, drove down to the airport, went through security, got on an airplane, flew out to D.C. for a meeting with a senator, landed, got out, got out, got there at the senator's office and was told that the meeting was canceled. Right in his face. They spit in his face and turned him around. The CEO of Coinbase. There's a massive tonal shift happening. And I think finally these VCs are going to get a little bit of what's coming to them. And all of these things that they've been just pouring money into are going to collapse around them into legal issues. At least I can hope. But the VCs? I hope. I hope that they oh, have. Because, you know. What do you mean legal I, issues? The VCs? They're just no, no, lose. they won't. No, 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 no. The VCs, no, not the legal issues. No, the companies. All of the companies they invest in. Yeah, the officers of the corporations are, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. But I hope it means the VCs lose out on the money, which hurts for them, you know? I hope it means they lose money on all this. Uh, there's a lot of liquidation preference shenanigans going on, too. I, I don't, if you're expecting a bloodbath, I'm not, I'm not sure you're going to. Well, it could, it should, oh, God, it could be. So the thing about this Howie test or whatever, it's basically if there's a central group of people that are managing the investment to try to make it increase in, in, in worth, that's a security, sure. right? If people got access to it be, before the general public got access to it, and when, when the value goes up, those people exponentially benefit, that's a security, right? Like, that's what all of these cryptos are. Anything after Bitcoin is a security because it was created by a guy and a, or a team, and they got access to the crypto first before anybody else did because they're the ones that created it, so they gave themselves some. All of them, all of them. They could go as far as they want. It is open season and the SEC likes to establish regulation through enforcement and they can go hog fricking wild. Every other crypto is vulnerable. It's up to them how far they want to take it. It's all in their hands. And could you imagine as an investor that being the situation? You just have to wait. Well, I'm just going to wait a few years and see how far the SEC burns all of this to the ground. And you're at their will. I mean, I, I think they're gonna burn it to the ground, and they and I, certainly what's been going on the last couple of years should not have been permitted, right? Well, you don't think uh, you don't think uh, monkey JPEGs are worth hundreds of thousands of dollars? I mean, I think stupid rich people who want to waste their money are certainly entitled to, but the shenanigans, let's say, like the actual crimes alleged, right? But seem pretty pretty solid there over in the Bahamas seem pretty bad, right? I don't know. 
we're going to see a lot of like arguing that the SEC is going to chase innov- innovation uh, off our borders and things like that. But I, I don't think so. Wait, have, have, let's read The Verge, right? The VC, re, re, worse, read TechCrunch. The VCs are already moving on to AI. They've already found their new bell of the dance, their whatever, bell of the ball. Exactly. It's They're not going to cry over this. Yeah, I don't think the crypto bros have figured it out. I don't think they realized it. I think they I think they're expecting, you know, money printer go burr again. So people will start speculating. And once these things start going up in price again, people will get interested. But I think it's past. I think people realize there's not much there. Turns out blockchain's not great at very many things. And there isn't going to be this entire this entire rewrite of every aspect of the web on top of blockchain. But but it's not useless, right? So th- there is a risk of throwing the baby out with the bath bathwater here. Yes. And and I am not like a huge Obviously, if you listen to the show, you know I'm not as enthusiastic as Chris, but it, it is certainly an interesting technology that I think for actual financial institutions has some pretty interesting applications that smarter, you know, honestly, financial security and financial compliance folks could probably think of and could probably utilize for the benefit of both those institutions and regular folk. Just, just not like gambling on JPEGs, like Chris is saying. Or it's just, it's gotten so, it's gotten so speculative. It's gotten so money fever driven. I do absolutely believe there is a market demand for a reliable, scarce digital asset that is trustworthy that all parties, even parties who don't trust each other, can trust. Even for something like you know, as a small business, where maybe a small business might sit on some money or sit on some gold, right? A small business can sit on some sats and they can do that digitally in a way that integrates with, you know, a more modern workflow. I can totally see it for individuals and things like that. But the speculative, you know, everything has basically become a 24-7 stock market casino is not only dangerous, but it's, it's deprived. The behavior has a depravity to it that people don't talk about, but it's there. I see it. And it's not healthy for people. And it really isn't creating anything of value. It isn't creating anything that is new. It isn't anything that we could like all kind of, it's not like a new monetary system we can all use, you know? So it's, it's sort of, it's sort of gross to watch it all happen. So I am personally hoping that the SEC really cracks down on this. There may be out of the 20,000 cryptocurrency projects out there, there may be three that are worth keeping. And I say that with absolute certainty. Because I have looked at them and I have watched them now for almost two years. And my takeaway is three out of the whole lot. And I think you could argue all of them, but Bitcoin can just go away. Ooh, that's so okay. It's really bad. It's gross. And it's, you know, it's just a result of where the market's at when this, when this monster was created. Yeah, it was too frothy, right? There was the, the money printer was doing a little too much burr. Yeah. You know, if anything, what we would want is... We would want a system that reintroduces some level-headed sanity, you know, something that can be audited and verified, something that can be accounted. And those are the things the blockchain does offer. So I think you're right. There are value there and that there's good things. And it makes sense for a ledger for Satoshis. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's wild to watch this happen. And I think the one thing that is a little kind of broken is the SEC is doing this through just coming in and burning places down throwing you know throwing down ultimatums finding people hundreds of millions of dollars really coming in as a gangster and just rocking these businesses often destroying them and that doesn't feel very that doesn't feel like a great way to get innovation long term because the risk is like you can go you can go try something and if you get it wrong you're in legal issues for the rest of your life and you're financially destroyed and your family's destroyed and all of your associates are destroyed. Instead of just like getting transparent regulation ahead of time from Congress and just getting ahead of these types of issues and creating like frameworks, which these companies could have worked with, they just sat on their hands and and screamed about boiling the oceans and didn't do anything of action. And so the industry just took off over the last few years. And now the SEC comes along and creates law by breaking knees. Are they from New Jersey? <laughs> Let me tell you, if, the, if they just hire some antitrust lawyers from like North Jersey, I think a lot of things have changed. <laughs> like those negotiations are going to go real different. Four score and seven boosts to go. Murphy Strikes Back came in with our big baller boost, 100,000 sats this week. 
hey guys, I'm two weeks into a new job as a controls engineer. That's all. And I have a run up against a very strict IT department when trying to get the hardware and automation and monitoring software we need to really effectively support production. Mm. What's the best approach to this stuff? Working closely with them and making sure they're happy with it? Or do I find someone to bulldoze it through? Nah. I'm interested to see what you guys think from the other side out there. Let me know. P.S. The robe showed up the next yes. day I ordered it. Oh, that's great. That's Bezos robe power. Why, why? So he's a controls engineer, very strict IT department. You know, he's there to do a job. To do that job, he needs some tooling. He needs some monitoring, some software. What would you do? Would you strong arm it? No. Would you begin a long political battle? I would try to convince them, you know, honey over vinegar here. Because one day you're going to be the one who either makes a mistake or, you know, has an unreasonable day. And you don't want to have bad blood or someone out to get you. It's, uh, it's also totally possible that the strict IT department could have been burned before. And this may be a little bit of, uh, this is a common thing that I walk into all the time. No, I promise I won't delete your database kind of situation. You know, I'm, I'm wondering if it isn't a, um, God, you know, because you could see, I could see like the contractor mentality. Like, I've got a job to do. I'm here for six weeks. Let's go. Right. And just go for it. And then maybe, you know, you plow a path forward in the future and you don't, you can just use that path over and over again. It's more likely, though, that <laughs> you're not going to be able to plow a new path. Not unless you have some really strong political positioning for some reason. Maybe you're really fortunate and you've got like great hair, great charisma and a great job security. <laughs> you could do it. I don't know. But if you if you can work with them and convince them and bring them along with you, then hopefully they can be an ally in a future project. And I would do it like such. I would plan for the worst and hope for the best. So I would start documenting everything right now. You need to already capture your thoughts on this. You're already behind. Take notes on what you need, why you need it, and the resistance that you've received and who you've been communicating with the days and the time. You need notes because if it ever does come down to a he said, they said, if you go into a corporate meeting and you've got a book full of notes, you just won. So start taking notes now. It's true. But work with them. Try to make it happen. Build the case. And I would, I would approach it as they're experts of their network. And so maybe you could describe the problem you need solved and ask for their recommendation. And then from there, take the conversation further. I hope <laughs> we shall see. Let us know, Murphy. I really would like to know how that works out. Yeah, let us know. That's wild. That's a tricky one. Hey, KP in the chat room says he also uh, received his coat of robe in time for his anniversary yesterday. Warm, cozy, though a little stiff still. Yeah, you're going to have to wash it with a little fabric softener. I thought so. I thought we'd just wear it for a while. You know, really kind of fart it up and stuff. That'll, that'll loosen it up. Dave Jones, the pod sage, comes in with 25,000 sets. Dude, I am right there with you. Talking about being sick. I tend to get sick always when I finally slow down a bit. The worst part, though, is the sleep. Most people tend to be able to just sleep a lot when they're sick. But the sicker I am, the less I can sleep. It's a self-licking ice cream cone. Dave, dude, brother. Oh, man. When this boost came in. I was running on two nights of no sleep and man, did I feel that boost? It was like, yeah, that one clicked. I, I don't know what has been going on with this latest round that I've, I've been sick. I have slept horribly, horribly. I was up at 4am today. It's always the worst. Just waiting. Hate it. So yeah, man. But Dave, it sounds like you're starting to feel a little bit better. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, DPG came in with 10,000 sats. Hey, Mike and Chris, I've been working with my work from home job for three months now. At the moment, I switch between my work screens to my personal screens all week long and have a lack of analog hobbies. I'm not having issues yet, but I want to avoid burnout and get less wired. Do you guys have ideas for tips for less screen time, especially during the winter months? P.S. It sounds like a friend of the show, Victoria Newland, had quite the 2022. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, she's been busy. <laughs> oh, poor old Vic. She's, uh, she's not looking so great these days, but man, is she working harder than ever. This is a great question, DPG. Because one thing that is always ringing in the back of my brain about the old bod is use it or lose it. I think it's kind of it, it just a, the way to think about your body is you either use it or you lose it. You use those muscles or you lose them. I, I guess you, you know, Mike, you've gotten out there. You've been doing gaming, tabletop stuff, on-screen gaming and off-screen. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of like paper gaming magic, obviously, and uh, kind of like weird German board games. It, it helps. It helps to get away from the screens for a bit. 
been trying to do more fitness stuff uh, with mixed results. So get out walking, things like that. It's important. I mean, it's it's got to be up to you. I, I wish I liked something like jogging, but I don't. But DPG, if you do, that would be, that's probably ideal. I got to be doing something. I just can't. I'm so horrible about exercise. I've been slowly, slowly, slowly working on getting together my tools and whatnot to work on cars, to do my my own car maintenance because we have, we have too many cars. And that just gets me out and about and moving. But it's not really exercise. But that's just, I'm always, you guys know me, I mentioned it recently. I'm looking for like little wins from time to time that I can get on the weekend. I think that always helps with the mental state with work too is if you can stack wins outside of work. I think that's nice. Thought Criminal comes in with 2,000 sats. They say there's no stupid questions, but I'm self-taught, so I've got lots of them. I find myself making wrapper functions to put functions inside of functions to skip screwed up intonation. Hell, hell. <laughs> How much of what I think I know should I throw out? And where do I go to get all of this right? Oh, man. Well, now, who says you got it wrong, thought criminal? Yeah. If it works for you. I mean, if well, it, unfortunately, it's an art, not a science, right? Even though they, they call it you know, computer science, really doing actual dev is more an art. You're going to get better over time. You're going to... A fun exercise that I like to do is look at code I wrote years ago and be like, oh my God, it's terrible. Oh, yeah. You you know, you're going to find that there are certain patterns of development that you kind of are drawn to and that you use a lot. It's just a process. Sounds like he wants mentorship. Yeah, it helps to work with other people, but I, I really wouldn't worry too much about it. Like, I wouldn't, you know go out and buy a patterns book and try to religiously implement everything in a pattern. Um, I would kind of just let it ride and, you know, try to code every day. A young dookie comes in with 4096 sets. Great work on the show, as always, guys. I enjoyed that toolkit discussion last week. I share your disappointment about Flutter stagnation for the desktop. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about the Tauri, or Tauri? Jeez, I'm so horrible at this stuff. Toolkit. It seems like something getting more discussion lately. T-A-U-R-I, the Towery Toolkit. Build apps smarter, faster, and create a more secure desktop. And of course, built on Rust. Optimized for front-end independent application development. Is it built on Rust now? Oh, yep. Well, I like it already. So I don't I don't know anything about this, but I will look into it for next week. Um, yeah, that does look, I'll put a little link in the uh, Matrix chat for everybody watching along. Build smarter and faster. You like those things, Mike. You like building smarter and faster. Oh, yes. Yeah. I mean, you don't want to build slow and dumb, do you? So, pff, thanks, <laughs> a young dookie. Love it. Uh, Anonymous comes in with 800 sats. Uh, I love the conversation on the Biden executive order. The government trying to make the market more competitive rarely goes well. Shoot, I wanted to make, make this point. I'm really glad I, I thought I remembered before the show wrapped up. Mike, tell me that Google's antitrust issues are basically over now right with with this 10 percent drop in the market with the way they're getting lapped by microsoft and chat gpt google just was handed perhaps a life raft in their fight against the federal government and antitrust because now they can say look since this case started the entire dynamics of the market have changed which has always been google's argument yeah they've always argued it could change on a dime and their domination could end and here we see the market changing on a dime, and Google, the entire narrative is that Google is behind, Google is losing out. I think they were just handed a gift. I, I think it would be an argument worth making in a negotiation with the enforcement uh, offices, yeah? Yeah. I mean, perhaps, perhaps, we'll see. Just to, It struck me as just what an opportunity for Google, for better, for worse. The Golden Dragon comes in with one of our last boosts this week with a row of ducks. It says, my worry on the uh, two bills for tech that you guys talked about last week is besides the fact that it circumvents capitalistic ventures, what else did they sneak in there that they don't necessarily, we don't necessarily know about? There is always a catch with these kinds of bills. <laughs> and pop, plus one for Popeye's being the best fast food chicken. Right on. Yeah. Yes. I mean, obviously Popeye's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they always sneak unrelated stuff into bills, right? That's unfortunately... Kind of how cynical we've all become. Yeah, uh, yeah, that is a concern, right? That's, I mean, yeah, it, 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 the tech sector is a unique, moving, fast-moving beast, and Congress is a 
slow moving monster. Incredibly slow geriatric. Yeah. So yeah. So it's it is a impedance mismatch. It, it, it's almost likely that like any like let's say app store regulation they try to do will be irrelevant by the time it passes. So yeah, I think it's almost it's almost a certainty. Uh, Cost peeling comes in with thirty six ninety sats. Uh, I'd love to see fountain disable earning sats as an option. Maybe that'd be a middle ground for a premium subscription. That's an interesting idea, Cost. So the fountain sends you sats from the advertisers. So there's like two in your feed. You'll have like two advertisements. Those advertisers they pay fountain in sats, and then fountain streams those sats to the listeners as they listen using Fountain FM. And Cost is saying, well, what if I could turn that off and it basically would act as a membership and fountain would get those sats. Maybe one day, Goss. And then our last boost from Tim Apple, 5,000 sats. Hey, guys. Just saying hi. Year after year, I find, it, it, I find it interesting that you are my favorite podcast, and I'm not even a developer. I just enjoy your takes on tech and in general. And the Star Wars banter, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Live Thank long you. and prosper, Tim. <laughs> you know, it's not Star Wars banter, but uh, we are now in the home stretch before Picard I think is it this week, Picard season three lands? Yes, they were advertising it quite aggressively. Are you going to watch it? I didn't watch season two yet. I wonder how much you would need to. But... Uh, or half of season one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's got the TNG cast, though. I mean, I guess I have to. Yeah. It's a good cast. <laughs> I guess I have to. I know. I know. I went, see, I've been watching the X-Files, and then I opened CNN, and I realized we're living in the X-Files. We sure are right now. Crazy. I'll tell you, the season three trailer for picard does have a few red flags in it i see some of the classic picard mistakes and one of the ways you can you can see this is if you go watch like a season two recap video of star trek picard there's like 15 different storylines in there it's it's crazy like every episode introduces something is this gonna be one where i have to like take notes (sighs) it's not as bad as season two i don't know I think you probably have to watch season two to see, you know, like why seven of nine is a first officer and stuff like that. It's, eh, it's so hard after watching Enterprise to watch the new stuff. It's just not the same. Because because oh, Enterprise, Strange in the World, still still my favorite of the new stuff. Yes, very much so. And honestly, if we are talking about Star Wars, I did really enjoy the Mandalorian. I thought that was really well done. I, I am actually considering checking out the legends of the jedi or no what would it no no what is it sith apprentice the one which like the undercover sith in uh the jedi temple or whatever oh that's a series it's on uh it's coming to disney plus next year i think that's an interesting idea that is kind of a i can see that it's just some dude sitting there trying to restrain his rage like yes are you feeling ill today my pad one no i'm just fine i said i was fine (laughs) i'm fine damn it thank you to our members you do get a discount in your member area for the robe if you'd like to grab that coderqa.co to sign up or you can get all the shows ad free at jupiter.party depends on your uh, preference but we appreciate your support mr dominic is there anywhere you'd like to send people yeah follow me on uh, the elephant site at dumanuko and twitter the same thing and also if you are looking to get some development done uh, particularly in the ios or any automation stuff got new al stuff coming out in two weeks it's gonna be great very nice i will mention that on march 4th we're going to have a little micro meetup for Linux Unplugged in the Mount Vernon area. I'll have details at meetup.com soon, but it's going to be March 4th, so it's about three weeks out, so I wanted to give people a heads up. If you're listening to Coder and you're in the Pacific Northwest and you'd like to come have some beers the day before LUP 500, keep an eye out for the meetup page. We'll have info soon. That. Links to what we talked about in this here program, those will be at coder.show slash 505. You'll find our contact page over there as well as our RSS feeds and all the goodies you need to get the podcast every single week. Of course, you can always send us a boost. Thank you, everybody who boosts into the show. Get Albi.com to get the Albi extension and then go over to the podcast index and boost from there or grab a new podcast app at newpodcastapps.com. Thanks, everyone, for tuning this week's episode of the Coder Radio Program, and we'll see you right back here next week. <laughs>